John chapter 15, beginning in verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. All things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Let's pray together. Lord, we we humble ourselves before you. We're, We're so grateful that you want to speak to us and you want to help us grow, Lord. And we want that as well. But we know that you want it more than we want it, Lord. And so we pray that today that we would you would help us, Lord, to yield our lives over to you and in submission to what your word says, Lord. And if there's anything that we need to repent of or be comforted in or be encouraged in, Lord, we, we are open for you to speak to, Lord. We thank you for the preeminence of your word. We thank you that you said it will outlive the heavens and the earth. We know nothing in this world that has that kind of uh, longevity, but you said it and we believe it. And so thank you for the privilege of being to have you build our lives upon your amazing word. We want to be doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving ourselves. We know that obedience to you preemptively uh, prepares us for trials that are sure to come, Lord, so that our house will stand. Thank you that you build those things into us as we yield to you. May our lives be marked with love for, for you and for one another and obedience to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we're, we're in this section here, John chapter 15, and we've been in this 14, 15, chapter 14, 15, and 16 section for a while. It's the last time of teaching the Lord Jesus had with his disciples. And if you're, anytime someone shares their last words with somebody, they, they choose the most important things that people need to hear and that someone needs to say. And Jesus needed to say this for their benefit and because he loved them. So he's bearing his heart to them. He's preparing them for being away from him to for his departure. And they will all scatter as was prophesied when, the, when, when God strikes the shepherd. Uh, and, and, and so he wants this to, these things to be built into them so that they will not be stumbled for sure and, and that they must be the ones to carry this message. The perpetuity of this gospel is depending upon them in the sense of the human instrument or the human vessel. And so Jesus knows that they'll be at great, um, they'll have great vulnerability, they'll be under attack by Satan. Um, and, and so Jesus wants to fortify them with this information that is so crucial for them. He's so loving to be able to, to do it. And last week we saw him tell them that he is the true vine, not Israel. They were proud that they were God's vine or God's vineyard. As I said, they even put on the temple doors, which were 60 feet high, that, you know, these gold, beautiful vines and grapes and everything, because they were proud that they were God's vineyard, but they had failed. Their fruit was, was not, was not um, evident to all for everyone to see. They're supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. They're supposed to be an example of Got what, what God can do in a, in, in, a, in a nation and people, and they fell short of that. And that's why Jesus added, as we saw, I am the true vine. Why did he even add, have to add the word true? Because they, are, they were already thinking that there was someone, something else or someone else, meaning a na- nation of Israel, as the, the, tr- the vine. And he's saying, no, I am the true vine. And we also saw that he revealed the father's the vine dresser, the one who's responsible for God's, uh, you know, basically his orchard, meaning the church, God's responsible, the Father is, uh, to bring forth growth. It's his responsibility. And God, he does all things well. He does all things, well. he still does all things well. 
And so he's responsible for that. And so we are the branches, he said, and we can't bear fruit in ourselves. Jesus said, apart from him, we can do nothing. Not, and so not apart from me, you can do some things. No, apart from me, you can do nothing. Of spiritual significance, we can do a lot of natural things, a lot of things that, you know, that are not spiritual, but the most important things are spiritual. And he says, if you want to accomplish anything, you have to be connected to the, to the vine to get your life and to get your sustenance. And, and, and that's the only way that you can bear fruit. And he, we also saw that the ones bearing no fruit need to be removed for a very specific reason, because they will rob the other branches that are bearing fruit. There's only a finite amount of nutrients and vitality that goes through the vine. And any branches that are not branches that bear fruit, he knows that it will hurt the other branches if he doesn't remove them. So we, we, we saw that in the ones that are bearing fruit, he prunes, and we saw that the word prune means cleanse. He cleanses uh, those branches that need cleansing so that, so that they can bear much fruit. And he does all of this cleansing or this pruning through the Word of God. The Word of God is always referred to, the washing or renewing of, by the Word of God. There's always cleansing and, and that happens, and he loves to do it. And we were told that that we have one job. We have one job related to all this fruit bearing, and that one job is to abide. And so um, we saw that what that means is is to to live in or to make our home in or to dwell. And the way that we do that is communing with the Lord and and yielding to Him and to fellowship with Him, the personal relationship. You know, it's sad to me that there are far too many people, and I'm not above falling. They didn't like what I was saying. I hope not. Hope they're not that passive aggressive. Am I my back? Okay, great. I mean, I need to slip them a tip once in a while or something to get on their good side. I don't know. But he does this through the word of God. And, and, and he cleanses us and then we commune with him. We have fellowship with him. So he's going to continue today and reveal more amazing truths. And so we're going to look at those things. And he's going to talk about abiding, but more specifically the implications of or results of abiding. So we're going to see three implications of abiding. Number one, we're going to see answered prayer is an implication. Number two, the Father is glorified. And number three, we prove that we're disciples of Jesus. So I've entitled this message, Three Implications of Abiding. Now notice in verse six, as we begin here, that um, what he does with the branches who don't bear fruit. Look with me at verse six. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. So, obviously, it's a big thing. You know, the clippings, when they would do all this pruning, the clippings would be used, we're told, even today, we're told they're used as kindling when they would burn burn other fires. And and so they were very aware of this type of, you know, um, physical arrangement with with the clippings of these, um, you know, vines and branches and everything. And... There's at least three different views on how this applies. Like, who are the branches? In other words, that's a big question. Who are the branches that are thrown into the fire? The first view believes the cast out branches are ones who, though once true believers, end up in hell for lack of abiding and fruit. They were once disciples, but now are cast out. The second view believes the cast out branches are ones who only appear to the, to the disciples uh, and never really abided in Jesus, um, and, and therefore go to hell like Judas. Judas was never a believer. He was in their midst and everything. And then the third view believes that the cast out branches are fruitless disciples who live wasted lives that are in effect burned up. And this passage doesn't refer to their eternal destiny, kind of like Lot, Abraham's nephew. So there are arguments to, there are arguments for, there are arguments against, all these positions, but you have to study those on your own because this is not basically the main purpose of the passage. The passage, the purpose of the passage is not eternal security. It's all about bearing fruit and um, the implications of it. So we will stick to that. Besides the pronouns in verses one through five are, are you, he's talking to you disciples. And then when he gets to verse six, he talks about they. So he's not talking to fruit-bearing disciples, which I believe that's what we are, um, almost exclusively here. And so um, 
I, I want to focus on the relevance connected to us here in this passage. So um, the, the, the point is, this is the point of what we should learn, is that God um, wants, what he wants is he wants fruitful disciples. And there's blessings connected with being a fruitful disciple and that we can't bear this fruit in, in and of ourselves. We have no capacity to bear fruit in and of it ourselves. So, um, you know, we, we all want to be in this room. We all want to be fruit bearing disciples. And so he's been explaining the key to that is abiding, abiding in Christ, living in Christ, um, making our home in Christ, communing with him, fellowshipping with him. You have, that connects us to spiritual life, spiritual power, spiritual vitality, the fruit of the spirit, God's leading, God's voice, all those things that are life giving and, and allows us to be able to bear beautiful fruit. And I want to remind us again that fruit coming out of our lives is supremely for other people's benefit. First for God's, of course, but for other people's benefit secondarily. And then after that, we enjoy it, of course, and he wants us to enjoy it, but that's not the prime recipient of the fruit that comes out of our lives. So I want to look at these three implications of abiding. The first implication is answered prayer. Look with me at verse seven. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. So if we abide in Jesus, God will answer our prayers. Very simple. He doesn't complicate it. It's very simple. And, and again, we have to remind ourselves, what does abide mean? It means to live in and, and to dwell and to make our home in. So we, he said we have to live in him uh, and, 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 and commune with him and fellowship with him. And that's what he wants. He desperately wants that for each one of our lives. He wants to have that personal, intimate, one-on-one -on -one relationship. What I was saying when, when they, they muted me, um, I was starting to say that so many people in the body of Christ, sadly, um, have a Sunday relationship with God. That's the only time that they look at his word, pray, or be engaged in spiritual things. And I've said this many times, but it's so true. If we only ate phys physically physical food once a week, how healthy would we expect to be? Jesus said, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we have to have that spiritual sustenance and that's being spiritually fed. So this intimate relationship of abiding in him, it means to have a real relationship where I talk to him. And when I actually hear him back, him speak to me, he said, my sheep know my voice. So when, 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 I, when I seek him and when I commune with him, he, will, he guides my life. He encourages my heart. He leads me. He confirms things. He redirects me. He's involved. I hear his voice clearly. And he, so he's describing this intimacy, especially when it comes to communing with him. You know, how do I hear his voice? How do I know God's voice? Well, let's say, let's say that I was in a room of a thousand women. Okay. That'd be intimidating. I get intimidated around women. I just have to be honest. I don't know why, um, but I am. But let's say I'm in a room, a thousand women and they turn out the lights and each woman comes up and says something right next to me, I'd be able to immediately pick out Sandy. I would know exactly which one was Sandy, my wife. Why? Because I've spent time with Sandy. I've spent time with her for more than 30 years. So I know her voice and, and I recognize that voice. But notice he adds, and my words abide in you at, in that verse, in verse seven or no, verse eight, wherever it is. Um, it's in the Bible. How about that? But, but, but so he, you know, he, he says, my words abide in you. How does that happen? How does, how does his words abide in us? Did God, does God somehow download the scriptures into our hearts supernaturally? I wish, but actually I don't wish because if if it, well, he has done whatever is best for us. So since he chooses not to download his scriptures into my heart automatically, must mean that his best is, involves me mining through the scriptures and meditating on the scriptures and memorizing the scriptures and hiding his word in our hearts. That's up to us to do. It doesn't just happen. And he knows it's best for us to do that versus just going, 
boom. And we have all that information automatically in our hearts. You know, it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, that in the ages to come, we will be discovering the riches of his grace. Even with our new bodies, he's not going to supernaturally deposit automatically all this information and we have nothing left to learn. We're going to be discovering for the ages to come, the riches of his grace, discovering how gracious he is. And the Holy Spirit led Paul to say that versus the riches of his knowledge, the riches of his patience, the, all the other attributes that we love about him. He chose to lead Paul to say the riches of his grace because that's, that's everything is, and everything that we need is God's grace. Will, be, will, will we be needing God's grace in our new bodies in heaven? Sure. We're not, we won't have a sinful nature, of course, and we're not going to sin. But, but we need God to, we, he's going to deal with us better than we deserve. Let's just say it that way. Um, and, and just the fact that we're there and he's imparting even more revelation to us in truth is an expression of his grace. So it requires time, it requires work, it requires hiding his word in my heart. But we, we live in a culture of instant gratification. I can be impatient with how long it takes Pop-Tarts to cook. Okay. I'm just confessing that. Sorry. I can be like, come on. It's been a minute. But it's true. I, I can get impatient. Like, when is that thing? And, find, and let me just confess something even worse. I didn't know that they were supposed to go in the toaster and be cooked until high school. So I was, I was eating them long before that, just right out of the box, you know? You know, not knowing that I could have... I could have this amazing experience with heated pastries with gooey gunk inside, you know. So again, now you're bringing, I'm bringing my issues up here, which I shouldn't do. But the point is, we want instant gratification. You can, we can get impatient with the microwave. Come on, let's go. Let's go, you know. And, and, and you know, he, we want the results immediately, but none of the work. So when, when I was told as a new believer about how to grow, they said, read your Bible. And today it's like, you hear things like, I'm not really a reader. Do we have that in audiobook? Yeah, we do. And if you're not a reader, I'm not condemning you. I'm, I'm, all I'm saying is it, when people tell you how to grow, just listen to what they say. You know, I, I didn't even think to ask about a devotional. And so, and devotionals have their place, but I think there at least should be a time of a foundation building where you're directly in God's word without anything else in between you and God's word in terms of someone else's thoughts for the Holy Spirit directly. How important is it for us as new believers to hear the Holy Spirit's voice where he speaks to us so much from his word? And I know he can use other things that aren't his word, of course, but I, but I really believe that God wants to use the Bible directly itself, especially as a new believer. So um, having his words abide in us is the key to answered prayer. And, and how does that work? What are the mechanics of that? How, how does all that work in terms of the key to answered prayer? Because he definitely added, in my words abiding you, it's very important that, that we're abiding in him. So we're communing with him. We're fellowshipping with him and his words are abiding in us. We're taking them in. We're, we're internalizing them. We're allowing them to have their full work done in our hearts. We're memorizing. We're meditating. Why does that lead to answered prayer? Because when you meditate on God's word and you study God's word and when you internalize God's word, you appropriate it, um, you start to learn what's important to him. You start to have his heart for things. Your wants becomes, I mean, his wants becomes your wants. Your desires start to align with his desires. Your priorities start to align with his priority. And so we see how wise and perfect his will really is as we study it. We see, man, his, his, he's so wise, it's so perfect. And, and you know, you want to say to God at that point, I want your will, God, above everything else. Don't answer anything that's not of your will. I don't want anything that's not of your will. You, you're thankful for the answer, the, the prayers that God didn't say yes to? I am. I mean, I'm so thankful he didn't answer so many prayers that I prayed. I wouldn't be here today, you know, if, if God had answered all my prayers, because I had prayed things a long time ago that would never make this be possible for me to be here. 
So you, you're just led to say, Lord, you are so good. I want nothing but your best for me. You know, Jesus said, wisdom is justified by her children. What does that mean? It means that the God's wisdom, especially revealed in his word, shape a life to where people look at that life after it's been shaped and goes, wisdom is so amazing. God's, God's word and what he says is so amazing because look at that life. That's what it means in Romans chapter 12 when it says we should, he wants us to prove that good and acceptable will of God. As I, as I, as I, you know, give my body over to Him, and 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 I don't let the world conform me, then what happens is my life starts to be a beautiful thing, and I prove that God's word and His Spirit and His voice is amazing. Because look at my life. You know, I'm I'm still amazed at at what God has done in my life. I'm you know when I'm with people that knew me from way back in the day, it's still hard for them to believe that. I'm doing anything that has to do with anything noble in my life. And I was on definitely on the wrong course. So we want what's best for him as we abide in his word and his words abide in us. And this is why this same apostle John that wrote this gospel wrote in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. We ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, we have that which we ask, our petitions. Well, how do we know what his will is? By knowing his word. You know his will by knowing his, his word. And that's the key. And when you internalize those things, he uses those things. You start praying things that are aligned with what his will is. Because you know his will because you've seen the revelation of his will in scripture. So that's how you can have confidence that God's going to answer your prayer because you're not going to ask for something that's not his will. So it's really simple, but yet we can complicate it, can't we? And we can um, feel like, well, I can just, and that's what's wrong with the, the false teachers and things that, that, uh, and that, that have, have us praying all these things that are connected to our, our selfish will, our selfish nature and our sinful nature, God's not going to bless that and because it's not revealed in his word. The second implication of abiding is the Father is glorified. Look at me at verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So again, we've said it over and over again, but even before we got into the Gospel of John and, and everything, we've talked about it in other studies, that Bearing fruit brings glory to God. God only produces good fruit. And it's good because it involves doing good or changing lives. And, and so we have to re be reminded of that. And, and so God loves to change lives for the better. I love seeing God change lives. I could say, in a sense, I'm addicted to it. I just love to see God change lives. And, and that's I'm excited when someone believes the gospel. I'm excited when someone receives Christ and then I start to see their life change right before my eyes, usually faster than they expect. And they're shocked. Can't believe how fast I'm changing, but I'm changing from the inside out. I can't tell you how many times I've heard a new believer say, I'm being changed from the inside out. It's nothing that I'm doing on the outside. It's all coming from within by the Holy Spirit. So he loves people loving other people and helping them be blessed. There's a new theological term, omni other centered, omnipresent, omnipotent, all the omnis, you know, about all knowing, all, you know, everything. How about omni other centered? You know, that's a new one. You guys can quote me on that. I don't really say many often things that are profound, but I think that one, that one's up there, at least in the, in the, in the running for being able to, to quote. Now, don't give me credit for that. That's kind of ridiculous. But Again, he loves to change lives. He loves to transform us and, and becoming more and more like Christ. But he uses people. He's chosen to use people to do it. Yes, he deals with us directly, of course, by his Holy Spirit. But so often, if you read in Scripture how he works in his body, he uses people's spiritual gifts and love and prayer and sacrifice to help people grow. So it all points back to him. His fingerprints are all over everything, and it brings glory to him and so that's why he has chosen to use people as flawed and sinful as we are. That's why the more he uses you, the more in awe you are of him, because you know your imperfections. You know how you fall short. You know how flawed you are. But he specializes in using flawed people. 
And that's why I always encourage new believers to, to not put any limitations on what he can do in their lives because the resources that he has available to help us be fruitful is limitless. And, and he's not limited by our limitations of our, how flawed we are. I love, I love how beautiful he's set everything up to be. We're also told in verse 8, third implication of abiding is we prove we are disciples of Jesus. He says in verse 8, the last part of the verse, that you bear fruit so you will be my disciples. You know, the, the, the word says that the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. But there are other ways that God confirms that we are his and we are his disciples. When we abide in Jesus and when we allow the Father to prune us, which means to wash us, as we've talked about, so we bear even more fruit in his evidence that we, that we are his disciples. You know, there's a point in the book of Acts when they like, this, is, this, this wisdom that's coming out of Stephen is amazing. And, 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 or these disciples, these apostles, it's amazing what they're saying. We know that they, that they must have been with Jesus because they couldn't know this apart from Jesus revealing it to them. And, and it's the same way with us. People know that we're the real deal when we're giving these points of wisdom for people and helping people and loving and serving them. They say they, they see if they have eyes to see and if they're paying attention and they're discerning, they see that this is an evidence that we're one of his disciples. It may be a crime one day in this country to be a disciple. It may be illegal just to be, just to be someone that, is a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we need to be ready for that level of persecution. To, 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 they, as the old saying goes, if, if being, a, being a Christian was illegal, was, is there enough evidence in your life where you could be convicted beyond a reasonable doubt? It's a great, it's a searching thing for us to think about. But he is living our, his life through us and it shows that we are connected to the true vine. You know, I've heard people say, what if you were walking on the beach and you saw someone painting and you just, you just think, I just wish I could bring that person and have them in my body and then they could paint through me and I could paint just as well as they do. Well, that's what the Lord does. He comes into our lives and he works through us and we have the creator, the greatest artist in the world, in the universe um, and outside of the universe doing things through our lives. And it's a beautiful expression of what God does. What a blessing it is to know that we're his disciples. And he wants us to be confident in it. And it's not based on anything that we earn or merit or deserve. But he wants us to be secure in it and allow that, that truth to affect everything in our lives. And that will only lead us to be more abideful. There's another word that I just made up, abideful can be abideful and 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 that way we can bear even much fruit and more fruit now we finish out our verses here with some extra encouragement that he gives and instructions and gives them a little bit of revelation regarding kind of their new identity or parts of their new identity look at verse 9 as the father loved me i also have loved you abide in my love verse 10 if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Wow, it's what, what revelation, what truth. They're unbelievable. He's telling them and us that he's loved us like the father loved him. That's amazing. The extent to which Jesus loved or was loved by the father, he loved his disciples. He shows no partiality. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He loves everybody equally. He's the, he's the most any being can love. He loves the most. There, there's, you can't even have anything that loves more um, than him. He's omnibenevolent. There you go. There's another theologian. I didn't make that up. Uh, you obviously know that. But, you know, the, he's omnibenevolent. He's all loving. And then he says, abide in my love. So the first question we would naturally have, and they probably had it as well, is how do I abide in your love? You're telling me to abide in your love. How does that work? How do I do, how do, I do that? Well, he answers that before they can even ask. What's the answer? Keep his commandments. Keep his commandments. You mean abiding in his love isn't a feeling? This world defines love as a feeling. 
what they're describing is affection. And affection isn't necessarily love at all, especially agape love. You know, so he's saying, no, it's not a feeling, but you, it's a showing of love. It's a demonstration of love. That's how we love. And we do that through obedience. As I said before, obedience is God's love language. That's how he receives love in a very significant passage. I'm not going to say over other things, but he, he loves obedience. And he says, if you love me, obey my commandments in other places. So that's really what touches his heart. And he knows us and he knows our sinful nature. And he knows that, you know, we, we fall short in this all the time. But he wants us to keep growing. We should be growing in obedience to God. We should be growing in that. We should be going the other direction. Either we're going forward or we're going backwards. There's really no, you know, kind of, um, you know, treading water, so to speak, uh, spiritually. So he's, and he's added, that's how the, the father showed love for him. The father showed that love for him. And he says, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love, I've already modeled it for you. And he never asks us to do anything that we haven't already, that he hasn't already done for us. So he says, I'll give you an object lesson. Look how I've been with the father, how obedient I've been. That's what you've seen me be with the father is exactly what I'm asking you to be with me. And that's how you abide in my love is obeying what I say. Verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. So here he provides insights into why he is saying all these things to them and that the motivation is that he wants us to have joy. Notice he says that my joy may remain in you. I mean, it's there now. They had God's joy. They had Jesus' joy and he wants it to remain in them and that he wants their joy to be full. So we see that. What a savior. Now I want to define what joy is and what happiness is because sometimes those things get confused. Happiness is circumstance-based. So sometimes I could be happy, sometimes I'm not happy based on my circumstances. When I go into the hardware store in El Granada and I'm looking for an ice cream sandwich, this is just theory. I'm looking for an ice cream sandwich in that freezer that's to the left. Once you go into the hardware store, I'm assuming there's a freezer in the corner on the left when, when I'm just, that's where I would imagine it would be. It's not me, like personal experience, like, no. But if I, if I went to the left and I saw that there's a place where ice cream sandwiches could be and they're out, I'm not happy. I, in theory, I'm not happy. It's theory. It's all theory. We, we know that. Um, but joy, in all seriousness, joy is, it's been defined as calm delight as a result of my relationship with God. And it's not circumstance-based. That's why Paul could be with Silas in that Philippian jail and they could be singing worship songs in the middle of the night and then, and then God starts tapping his foot to that tune and there's an earthquake. Um, I'm kidding, it didn't, probably didn't happen, but you know. But, but they, they're, they're there in prison. He's, you know, the prison epistles he wrote from prison and the theme of the book of Philippians is joy. But he's in prison writing it. His, his, not, his joy is not connected to circumstances. I'm sure he wasn't very happy being in there. But God had him in there. And God broke him free. That's why, again, when I said when he was in, when he, he wasn't worried about being in prison in Rome because he's already had multiple jailbreaks that the Lord accomplished on his behalf. He knew that he could be gone out of there in a second, but there's a purpose in it. It's a kind of a little picture of our lives. There's purpose when we suffer and we go through difficulty because he's trying to make us more and more like Christ and make us more mature. We want all the maturity, but we don't want, it, we don't want what it takes to be broken in a, in a godly way for that maturity to happen. So he wants us to have joy. And that joy, again, can't be messed with because it's my, based on my relationship with God. That can't, no man can mess with that. I can't mess with that. It's, it's a beautiful thing and it's constant. It wants us to, joy, we can be in horrific situations and have total joy in the moment because we know God, we're in God's hands. And if he, we're going to see him work, this is an opportunity to see him work in a powerful way. And the worst thing that can happen is that we graduate to heaven. That's the worst thing that can happen to us. We could go to the best possible location we could even imagine and, and to be with our Lord. That's the worst thing from a human standpoint that could happen to us. 
So he wants us to have that joy. Look at his heart towards us, that your joy may be full. Today, he wants your joy to be full. He wants you to be full of his joy because of your relationship with God, because what he's doing in your life, how he's for you, how his promises are yes and amen, how he's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given us his spirit. You know, I has not seen, no ear has heard, no inner is in the heart of man. What God has prepared in advance for those who, who walk in him. Something along those lines, close. But that's talking about the, the, the new covenant and the God's plan of salvation. He's revealed that to us. He says in the next verse, so that we can understand and discern by the Holy Spirit that we have, he's given everything that we need to be able to have a personal and intimate relationship with him. You know what's really important um, and key to joy in the kingdom of God is relationships. Primarily, like I said, our relationship with him. But also it has to do with each other, one another, as we build each other up, as we, as we uh, seek him to be used by him in one another's lives. That is happening because of our relationship with him. And that touches on joy. And he loves that. Do you know anybody that's a believer that just models joy? I know I'm not that person. You're not thinking of me. Uh, I'm not always exuding joy in my relationship with God. I hope I grow t more in that, of course. But there are people that I can think of right now that they just model joy. They just model. It's beautiful. But the most important thing to remember about that is that it's more beautiful to God. It's more beautiful to him that he sees that joy that comes from a, a, an amazing relationship with him. We're his body. So that's why when we see the, especially spiritually mature people, the full aggregate total of, of all that character and all that, that, that personality, we're seeing his body. We're, we're seeing him living through the body of Christ. And it's beautiful. So many of you model that. So many of you model that joy and that relationship, and it's, it's such a beautiful thing. It's been said only heaven has a monopoly on joy, and nothing can stop that. No antitrust government agency can say, sorry, you got the monopoly on joy. We're shutting this thing down. Can't happen. We have joy because of our relationship with him, and we are in a loving relationship with him, and we're in a responsive relationship with him. We love him because he first loved us. Legalism and man-made religion says that we have to do certain things to get God to give us something or to love us or to accept us. God is, he's revealed that there's nothing that we could do, that only God could provide a way for that. And, and so we get to enjoy that relationship all the time because he's pursuing us and we're responding our whole life, our whole Christ, all of our obedience, all of our love for him, all of our passion for him, all of that should be an overflow of what he first did for us. The most mature believers in your life are constantly blown away by what he did for them on the cross and how he showed that love. And that's why they are who they are, because they're continuously blown away by what he did for us. And they love communion remembering that formerly, corporately, in unity as a family. They love communion. They love having doing that together. The world has no capacity for joy. The, the world is empty and bankrupt. They have no capacity for joy. They can't give any joy, but God gives joy, and it's a beautiful thing. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So that's important to us. Why does he tell us so many times that he that for us to love one another? Because our natural propensity would be to not love one another. And he's not talking about affection. Listen, he's not talking about affection. He's talking about action. Practically in real life, do actions of love towards one another. That's what he's trying to say. Because we think it's just this feeling. And sometimes, you know, we've lost that loving feeling. You know, and, and we're like, oh, I fell out of love for my spouse. That's not what God's talking about. He's talking about choose to do what's best for them. Choose to do what's right for them. Do loving acts for them. That's what, that's what God did. He demonstrated his own love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. When we were still at enmity with him, he died for us. All of the sins that he died for are all future tense. They're all future tense. They're all what happened in the future. So he, again, I love to say this because I, I love to meditate on it. 
He died for sins that you, haven't, you and I haven't even committed yet. So he's not struggling with, our, with who we are. He knows who we are. He knows what he's getting when he gets us. He's okay with that because he is gracious and he will be dealing with us on the basis of his grace and the riches of his grace that we will learn about for all eternity, as I mentioned. And then he gives the real definition, the ultimate definition in verse 13. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Now, this isn't just his death on the cross. He laid his life down when he came to earth. He, when in the incarnation, we came and humbled himself and, and humbled himself and, and to the point where he would become even a human. Read, read Philippians chapter 2. You want to learn about everything that, that he did. He, he came down and he humbled himself. And, and so that he gave his life for us just by coming here. Just, and then to say nothing of his serving us and to doing what's best for them and, and, and laying down his life was a beautiful expression, but it started from the very beginning and it culminated in him dying on the cross. And he still kept serving them even afterwards. So God's called us. We, we can't, we're not, I mean, Paul talks about a good man, maybe some of us would die for he said, but, so, but he's saying, God demonstrated his love into that will while we were still sinners. We weren't a good man, but we were sinners. Christ died for us. So we can lay down our lives by giving our time, by giving our patience, by enduring things that are happening in other people and through other people, by being gracious, by loving, by listening, by giving our resources. There's many ways that we can lay down our life and love other people. And ultimately, he may ask us to lay down our physical lives for somebody. We should be prepared to do that. Then he, then he says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Now, we would think it should be read this way. You are my friends. You, I mean, you are my servants if you do whatever I command you. That's what we would expect the verse to say. But it says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So it, it's a beautiful thing because he calls us friends. Wow, there's so many where like your mind can go so many different directions thinking about that he would so closely associate with us to call us friends. But we're not just friends, we're children of God. We're co-heirs with Christ. And we are servants as well. But, but he doesn't call us those things. We don't identify supremely as a servant. We, we supremely identify as his child and as his friend. Though we should still, of course, have that reverence, which I, I think that we all would agree with. Let me close out with verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. I have made known to you more than mere commands. That's what I would, that's the kind of dialogue you would have with a servant. You just bark out commands and they do what you want them to do. But this goes much deeper because he's saying, the fact that I let you in on my heart, my plans, my uh, intentions, the ways that I do things, my thinking on things. Only friends exchange that kind of information. And he's saying, I, exp I demonstrated to you and I've already called you friends and because I have let you in on things that you wouldn't let in on a servant in on. So revelation is an expression of our friendship with God what God reveals to us. And he's revealed a lot. He's, you know, he's told us what his master is doing through this book and what he wants to do. So what a privilege it is to know what he's doing and be in the know. You know, it's so funny. I've said this so many times. We go through life as believers walking around with default information. What I mean by that is just by default, we know information of where we came from, why even like, yes, we die, but why we die, the solution, why we are, what we were placed here for, our purpose, where we're going, what's going to happen in the future. Like we walk around with this basic knowledge that, that the world has no clue about. They're going completely blind through life. They don't know if the sun's going to actually just turn off tomorrow and, or just, you know, the, 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 the um, gravity just stops. All these things that we know won't happen because of scripture. So we, we just... I think it's sometimes we can take for granted of the revelation that we've received from him. And the heart behind it is that we're his friends and he loves us and we're his children and we're intimate with him. He wants us to value that. He wants us to know that, that,
That's not just by accident, and there's a reason for it. So I love the fact that he says, but I have called you friends for all things. Notice the word all there. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. So he let them know everything. There's so much that we don't have in scripture. Is it, wouldn't it be great in heaven? And he could obviously do this. Is, is Let us just watch everything that he did during his public ministry. You know, a heavenly GoPro, you know, that's there. But by the way, do you know GoPro started in this building? GoPro started here. That's why we like to film everything. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but yeah, they, they didn't take care of this place from what I heard. They rode their bikes through here and did all kinds of crazy millennial things. Millennials do. No, I'm not picking on millennials, but I mean, come on, ride your bikes through here. So anyway, it's great to, to be able to bring that illustration and just say, hey, this is where GoPro started. How many people could say that? Nobody else but us. So he's, he, he basically says this is a privilege and he, he wants us to appreciate. And I love the fact that he says, enjoy it. Let your joy be uh, to the full. You know, I think that's probably where they, you know, joy is in the word enjoy. And I think that's probably connected. I don't know. Just a wild guess. But he has such a great heart towards us, doesn't he? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you do, Jesus, call us friends. Thank you that um, you let us know what you're, what you're doing. You let us in on those things. And thank you, Lord, that you've given us this capacity to be able to know what you're doing and to, to be just so uh, privileged with revelation. So we thank you for that. We thank you for uh, all the things that this, this passage reveals to us, Lord. We love you. We love how you're working in our lives. We love our family here. We love how we're growing in you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.